<laughs> Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight, even though it's a light crowd. Um, the College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we have a speaker who will then, uh, we, I'm sorry, we have a brief announcements period. Then our speaker will speak. It will be followed by a uh, question and answer session. And then we'll have our infamous rebuttal period where you can speak on or off subject about anything. The speaker gets the last word. We need to be out of here by 8.45 because the restaurant closes at 9. There are basically two rules from the, from the College of Complexes. One is one fool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. <laughs> All right? Don Munch is in as a political activist, humorist, and I, I can't read it, for over 50 years. He has also been the longest. I'm sorry, I can't, I'm having trouble reading it right. I'm going to go to the specific college of complexes. Donald Meinhausen, longtime libertarian, Sinester 2019, not only marks 50 years of the modern moon man, the Stonewall Rebellion in Woodstock, but also the modern libertarian movement. He will discuss key events of 1969 that ignited the modern movement, such as the final students for a democratic society convention held in Chicago, and the Young Americans for Freedom Convention in St. Louis. He will also talk about the history of the movement since those important events. Let's welcome Donald to the podium tonight. And have a good evening. Sorry, I was able to be here. Thank you very much for speaking tonight. I came here to hear that. Thank you very much. Oh, my money I suppose everybody can hear me right now? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay, my name is Don Meinshausen. I've been, been a political activist, humorist, storyteller, going back for over 50 years, covering not just the libertarian and the conservative movement, but also the left movement as well. Um, and during that time, um, I've been to Chicago um, several times. Uh, one. Uh, once for the SDS National Convention. Chicago is a very interesting place, but the fact that, um, well, you had a Nazi Republican run here a couple of years ago, and the LaRouches took over the Democratic Party nomination a couple of years ago. I'm really kind of wondering why I came here. But then again, I guess radicals seem to collect in Chicago. And it has a very long radical history. Um, a lot of this has to do with the stockyards and uh, Saul Alinsky and people like that. And uh, you've got, you know, you've done a lot. Now, first of all, also it has a lot to do with, you know, your, with your tradition of comedy as well. Politics and comedy basically has a lot to do with each other. It's basically the whole storytelling tradition. Now. In the 60s, I got involved with Students for a Democratic Society. Basically, I was just curious, wanted to see what was going on. And I got involved, went to meetings, kind of as a uh, political alchemist. I wanted to see, basically, why they were growing so fast, why were they were so popular. And of course, the answer is obvious. You know, people were angry about the war. They were angry about conscription, racism, the whole Greek, you know, gap between wealth and poor and all that. And what happened is that I found that the activists were usually pretty likable. I started a chapter in my, in my college very easily. But what the thing was is that the more I got involved with SDS, the stranger and the stranger the, the top political activists were. Now, 50 years ago, just about every SDS activist that you ever met was a Maoist. Some of them were influenced by Stalin. Does anybody ever hear of anybody who's a Maoist or Stalinist nowadays? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah, we well, got him here. They're pretty obscure. I mean, now with the internet, you can find 
a Maoist monarchist if you want to. Well, that would be, let's say, a guy who likes North Korea or something like that. So I got involved with you know these these people, and I remember going to the last convention that they held, which was in Chicago, June of 1969. And it was held, I don't know if the place still exists or not, but it was an old wrestling arena from the 1930s. And when you get right down to it, that was just the ideal place for them to have a convention. Because it was a kind of a sweaty wrestling match from that time. And, and at some point, uh, it almost broke out in, you know, real fighting, in, in, you know, in the alleys and, and all of that. And, uh, I remember also at one point there was a walkout from some people and there was, there was a, this, this kind of sloganeering. There was a guy who was a Black Panther who gave a talk and somebody didn't like what they said and uh, you know they, they started denouncing him and they were saying things like, power to the workers, power to the workers. And other people started a, another slogan, white, white racism, because they, you know, the white people denouncing a black person and stuff like that. And this kept of stuff kept on going back and forth and back and forth as if they were making sense. There was about 50 different tables passing out literature, and all of it in the, the most thick verbiage you've ever seen before. And I remember at that time, the weather people, the weather underground came up. And their principal thing was, if you're a white person, you should be guilty about having a stereo or a car or anything like that. Because every, you know, all that stuff came from exploitation of foreign countries or something like that. We're terrible and all that. And this was a group that was kind of grab the romantic imagination of uh, young intellectuals at that time. In fact, I remember Esquire magazine had an article showing all the various factions that were in SDS and what their, you know, their difference was and all that. And there was about 1,200 people there, 600 were with, with progressive labor, SDS that was going to be taking them over, and the other were other factions, but they were all more or less Maoist. The other people were like Maoists on acid or something like that. And they separated into their, their two groups. There were actually two wrestling arenas combined. And then they split up, and I remember they asked for a bunch of volunteers to help defend the SDS National Headquarters. That was and I volunteered. And we were there, sitting there, huddled in the SDS Headquarters. I paid $80 a month for rent or something like that. And every time, you know, a bunch of strange people walked down the streets or some cops came by, people were screaming, oh, they're going to come and attack us, or something like that. And the next day, we had a meeting at a church and the church had a little epistle for the day, you know, that, you know, that something from the Bible at these the times that make men mad and they end up destroying themselves. And after that, it just got less and less and less. And people were saying, why are we studying these people? Why are, you know, why are we paying attention to them? They don't even know themselves what they want. Now, at the same time that I was involved with SDS, I was also involved with Young Americans for Freedom. Now, some people will say, well, YAP is a right-wing organization. You were involved with it. And they're basically, uh, thing left, they wanted to destroy SDS. How could you be involved with both YAP and SDS at the, left, at the same time? And I said, well, the way it worked out is I was gotten the desk as a curiosity and somebody said, hey, I know some people give you money to attend the conferences. They just want to take a look at your notes. And I said, oh, that's fine. Well, what is this group? House on American Activities Committee. Yeah, you remember that. So 
the guy who was my contact with the former communist who, in the 1950s when he was young, and he was yelling and screaming a little about how horrible they were and all that. I put him in law, and I gave him information, and uh, I remember meeting up with him and somebody from the Chicago Red Squad, it's in Chicago, and uh, he was like, you found a lot of good stuff at this SDS conference, but this is the most important. I say, no, you've got to be kidding. You mean the stuff about pussy power? Well, that's it. That, that's important too. But you have this resolution here calling for SDS to legalize marijuana, and I said, no, well, really? Well, I guess he didn't know that there were people in Young Americans for Freedom were pushing around a resolution calling for the United States to end the war against marijuana as well. So I just decided, well, this is going to take some thinking about. And, uh, I, you know, when I finally came know. back home, um, I was involved with some people called the Libertarian Caucus of Young Americans for Freedom. A lot of us were objectivist, libertarian, free market. Um, supported, and uh, we were, in a sense, coming to the realization that the war wasn't doing anyone any good. In fact, the communists were trying to keep the war going as long as possible because, well, it cost maybe $100 to put a, a Viet Cong out in the field. However, it cost maybe $10,000 to put a U.S. soldier in the field. So therefore, if, this, if the communists lose 10 people for every one soldier that we lost, that's 1000 versus 10000 bucks. So that's not, I can see in the sense that if you really hated the United States, you want to see the United States in this war as long as possible. So we also had to, to been talking among ourselves, and we decided that marijuana should be legal because a lot of us were smoking marijuana even when we were discussing this. And also, um, we had a resolution with a position within Young Americans for Freedom that we wanted to go to a volunteer army as soon as possible. And uh, so I got support. I'm, through Carl Hess and his son, Carl Hess Jr., that we should, in a sense, push for those resolutions, but in a much more radical sense, within Young Americans for Freedom. Meaning that what we wanted to do is not just support legislatively ending the draft, but we wanted to have draft resistance as well. Now, I knew this was going to go over like a proverbial lead balloon, but I figured. This would be interesting. I mean, it's political alchemy one more time. And yeah, I had decided that in order to really show that they were anti SDS, they had a, this, this theme of smash the new left and all that. And so I said, well, okay. So I had introduced this resolution calling for you to support draft resistance. And that went old, you know, that failed, obviously. And what I had done is that Yap's symbol was a torch of liberty from the, statue, from the Statue of Liberty. And I arranged so that at the point that this resolution was voted down, I arranged for a friend of mine to go to the lectern, like here. He raised his draft card and lit it on fire, therefore becoming the torch of liberty. That pissed off all the traditionalists or right-wingers in the audience, and a malice started. Something that we didn't really expect to happen, but it happened. And, but after, you know, we broke it up and all that. And I noticed that among the libertarians, and there were a couple hundred of us at this convention, decided why do we want to have anything to do with these assholes? And, well, it, it really made some 
a lot of angry stuff about Thank you. <laughs> within Young Americans for Freedom. They didn't like what I had to say to the House Internal Security Committee as well when I testified before there, in which I said that I had been sent in to investigate a very dangerous organization that killed a lot, of, uh, supposedly represented a case that killed a lot of people and destroyed a lot of property. And in my involvement in this organization, I covered a much more dangerous organization that has killed more people and destroyed more property than SCS ever could. This organization is the United States government. Well, when I did that, they called the hearings to an end. I got my five minutes of fame on Walter Cronkite, and um, I basically got involved with people who started the libertarian movement. Now, it's interesting to see what we have accomplished as libertarians. Um, we are now bigger than all the Marxist movements in the United States. And you could throw in left anarchists, and we accomplished an awful lot in terms of getting people elected, getting books published. In fact, I would say our biggest accomplishment is that we've not only gotten bestsellers on the you know New York Times and other reading lists, but we have also gotten a lot of science fiction passed. Now, if you look at the difference between the left, or at least the Marxist left, and libertarians is that science fiction people are people of the imagination and so are libertarians. A lot of them are also very well versed in the high technology. A lot of people that you uh, might want to look at, like a guy who founded Wikipedia, for example, I founded Wired Magazine, uh, Peter Thiel, and a bunch of others are very well accomplished in terms of their, um, what they've done in technology as well as uh, some of their other writings as well. So we've done really great in that regard. And that, I mean, you know, it just, we're much more available in, in people's consciousness. And of course, the biggest reason for a lot of this is just the growth of the World Wide Web. Um, how many people here know anybody who's what they call politically astute, no matter what your political point of view, and gets their information from newspapers, radio, television? Well, you might be an, an exception, no, but no, everybody it's my, it's my, gets that stuff, information from... Uh, it's my father. Okay, your father. Yes. All right, well, once you know you've reached over 60, 70 years, 70 or 80 years old, you know, you're, you're kind of out of it. But, but I don't even, I go to college myself <laughs> right now. Uh, and I talk to young people there. Everybody gets their stuff from blogs, podcasts, really. Facebook, things like that. And in, in the sense that everybody jumps in and can make their, their point of view, who wants to sit down someplace and have somebody talk to you and lecture you constantly and you don't have a chance to talk back. And I think this is the reason, for example, that we have the, the victory, uh, for example, what happened in London just recently or Hong Kong a few weeks ago. And it's just that information has become such a decentralized event. And you also look at, for example, that I remember when there were just a few political comedians during the 50s and the 60s, and now it's just, it's the ones that are most, uh, in a sense, the most political, seem to be the, the best commentators. Now, I try and stay aware uh, of not just conservative and libertarians, but also the left. And a guy who I really respect on the left is Jimmy Dore who is a comedian who covers and just excoriates people like Hillary and a lot of uh, the, the presidential candidates. And it's just great. And, and it shows him in a club, having a, a nightclub format, 
maybe a bunch of people on a panel or something like that. And what's happened is, is that the people who used to be really good, um, like, you know, or just the, the Daily Show, Colbert Report, they've sold out. It's really sad. And I think it's just important that people, in a sense, in this very open, fertile, moving market of ideas, is that you know, the comedians are the ones who are, who are, you know, are cashing in. Now, I would say you know, one issue where this has made its most progress is that I remember in 72, 12% of the American people were for legalization. Now we have it in 11 states. This, of course, is one of them that's going to be seeing it soon. We're also going to be seeing um, in various cities a resolutions calling for, or that, let's say, decriminalized psilocybin, DMT, MDMA. In fact, uh, Peter Thiel, who's a very big high-tech libertarian um, money maker, has been, uh, he's some of the money behind getting MDMA legalized. And I think that, in a sense, as people move from an alcohol consciousness, move to a marijuana and psychedelics consciousness, it's going to mean that they're going to be much more flexible and open about other types of political decision making as well. Um, I have been involved in those largest dealer in psychedelics and marijuana, and not just the libertarian community, but also in the pagan community as well. During this time, I used to arrange uh, lectures by Robert Anton Wilson, great Chicago writer, who was writing for Playboy at the time, and also for Timothy Leary, Robert Shea as well. And it's, you know, you can see, in a sense, a kind of a a growth every decade or so. More and more things are open to be discussed about. The changes that we have seen in treatment of, of the gay community has been absolutely phenomenal. To almost complete acceptance, as we have seen also the, uh, a growth in respect and acceptance of blacks, women, Hispanics, and in which you can much more so than, you know, than, than there just was a couple of decades ago. And I think this is absolutely wonderful. And a lot of this has to do with hot psychedelics, as well as the growth of the electronic media. And I see, in a sense, that people who are prejudiced, react, you know, and uh, intolerant, they're being left by the wayside. Uh, I remember when I was in the 60s, people would find out, some people in the Marx movement were angry with me because I used to smoke marijuana. Or I had my hair long, that turns off the workers. And I also <coughs> noticed that they had a real hard time to deal with humor. Uh, and just in terms of, you know, some of the, their own stuff that they were doing. So, how many people here, by the way, are libertarians? Okay. What? What your person? Libertarians. Okay. All right. And I'm just, you know, I have seen, you know, there's a whole kind of a, a loss of direction from people on the left in that they're back, you know, they're backing. People like Bernie in 77 is never going to run again. Uh, and people who say in the conservative movement who are supposedly religious and their backhand guy has been divorced three times uh, and who's corrupt as all hell. Right. What's my time? I think you're still good. Yeah, please. Okay. So we have all of this as, as, as well. Now, one thing that I've done is I've, I've, I've collected political songs over the years. And uh, I remember 
Murray Rothbard taught me this one song. <laughs> and it goes like this. <laughs> it's time to write the great wrong done 10,000 years ago. The state consumed in love, war and hate remains our only hope. So circle brothers, circle sisters, victory is thine. Come meet your fate, destroy the state, and wave black banners high. And I always thought of Murray as being right wing, but you know he he, he could move around a little. Um, I also remember that I, there was one political song that I knew that was actually used by the Trotskyists to attack. Uh, attacking Soviet Russia in the 1930s, and that was later used by the younger conservatives. As for myself, I've written a little bit on this. Um, one goes something like this. There's no government like, no government like, no government I know. Something about us so appealing, and I know that we can make a go. For all we have to do is start repealing and get rid of the status quo. There's no taxes, like no taxes, you'll smile as they go down, for you really don't need welfare, for you can live like a millionaire, for all you need is some laissez-faire, it's great, go smash the state, it's great, go smash the state. Oh, no, no. And it's, and by the way, just to show you, we, Poorest among us, and I'm a pretty poor person, I make less than 10000 a year, has a better lifestyle than someone who lived a hundred, even a king of a hundred or two hundred years ago. I mean, I go on the internet, have access to all different types of ideas, better than the discussion and all that. One pull at a time, please. That's great. Okay. All right, one full at a time, one full at a time. Okay, how much more time do we have? We got plenty. We got plenty, so. What? We have plenty. Okay. Just, keep well, just going give me a warning, okay? No, I'll give you a warning about 15 minutes before. Okay, fine, fine. Keep going and. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, <coughs> things have changed and they're changing a lot. Um, I did this for about 20 years being a dealer, going from one conference to another, sometimes even, you know, selling various things at conferences or whatever, and uh, going to, you know, to foreign countries and seeing basically how this type of thing is being reproduced in other countries as well. A whole change of consciousness being much more open. I mean, it would be really difficult to find somebody who had the same ideas as Stalin or Hitler nowadays, it's just, you have to basically open a museum for, to house people like that because of the, the such ways of living and expressing themselves are just so isolated. It's like trying to find somebody who, well, I'm anti-Semitic because I've never met a Jew, which is in the sense they've done studies of anti-Semites. And that's what they found, is that they never met, met someone who was Jewish. That kind of thing. And nowadays, everybody, you know, can just access any opinion or combination of opinions at the press of the time and see where people are coming from. Um, also, look, in this, in, just in this one restaurant, you have exposure to about 10 different cuisines, and they found out that people who, in a sense, are willing to go beyond a certain cuisine are more experimental and more tolerant. So we're going there as well. Um, and if you vacation, you you know, you go to one place, oh, here they have legal pot, here they have legal prostitution, you know. <coughs> here that you can own a gun, here you can't own a gun. And you can, you can see in your own terms of your own legal experimentation in a different community, you can learn 
in a sense, how different societies can react. This kind of thing is just, it wasn't even heard of a few decades ago. And also, I, I, this is something else that I've noticed, is that when I was doing this in the 60s, it was very rare for people of different ideologies would either have any kind of civil discussion. And it was just everybody would stay to your, literally, your own neighborhood. And now everybody just, you know, you meet, you talk, you say, oh, did you, did you listen to this podcast? Did you read this on Magazine Hero? I'll send you a link and all that, and you can see it. And, and, and the thing is, nobody know, even knows that you, you've read this stuff. It's just there. And now, for example, we have working together anti-war activists, not just from the libertarian point of view and the, and, the, and the left point of view, but also from the conservative point of view. For example, the American conservative has lots of anti-war stuff. Um, and you find also, it's beginning to look to me like the Democrats tend to be more pro-war than the average Republicans. I mean, Trump, even though I don't like Trump, made some good points about maybe we shouldn't be involved in NATO. Great. And people who left were actually complaining about this. You can build them with One full at a time, please. So we have that type of problem as well. Now the question is, is that what are you doing in a sense to try and get your ideas outside of your own small circle and try and find common points of view? Because I think when you get right down to it, if you're political, you want to form single issue coalitions from different points of view in different communities so that when you talk to people in power, you say, well, look, we're just not some small group here or there or whatever. We're a coalition of a lot of different people. And so therefore, take a look, for example, of the whole abortion issue. I know people who are pro-life, who are pagans, atheists, um, feminists, and I know evangelicals who are pro-choice. And so this is, a, in a sense, another thing about the great dispersal of ideas and points of view within our movement. And I mean, we could go, for example, on some type of hunt in which we can, you know, decide to, okay, you see if you can find a, a Catholic pro-choicer or something like that. The person would probably come find somebody within five minutes or so. And I'm, I'm not saying anything pro-life or, or pro-choice, but that's the way things are going. Now, how many people here know young people who are just starting to be politically active? Do you have that pen? Okay. Do you have that pen? Here's an idea for them, whether they're libertarian, right wing, or left wing. Let's say they're looking for a way they can make good money and they can be independent in their political thinking. I would suggest a field called forensic accounting, in that you give them the books of an organization government, non-profit, or profit, and say, see whether you can find something wrong here. Because, as we know, a lot of organizations start off good and end up being very, very corrupt. And, and I hate to say this, but sometimes charities are the worst of all. And you could, let's say, as a, if you're a person who's well known in this, and you just let what you're doing stop what you're doing, Maybe you might have to work for an ordinary accounting firm for a couple of years, but you could just say, yeah, we can spot fraud. We can spot inefficiency, which to me is almost as bad as that, and be able to keep organizations on their toes. And when you get right down to it, this is what politics is all about. Finding the bad guys, finding the organizations that are doing good and rewarding them with your services your business, etc. And so therefore, if you've got left-wing values, right-wing values, libertarian values, 
you have here an opportunity to make good, honest money and be a powerful person in no matter what community you want to be. So I would recommend that to people. It's a matter of how do you, in a sense, discover what works and what doesn't work, and being able to share that with other people. And you can find, for example, organizations. I mean, the weird thing is, for example, you look at the Catholic Church. They do some amazing acts of charity and education. Um, and you could say some very good things about certain institutions, like a university or something like that, what they're doing, and say, great, and help them out or whatever. But then again, you have to have the priestly scandal. So in a sense, you have organizations that are affiliated with each, with other ones, some because of a couple of individuals or just whatever, are not operating as they should. And the way I see it is that governments are good for a few things. Private enterprises are much better for a lot of things. But I think that things like unions, churches, fraternal movements, they tend to be better for things like welfare, education, and health care. Um, another thing that I've noticed, too, is that I go to a health food store. store. How, how many people here go to a health food store? Or see, let's, okay. Or maybe see a chiropractor or something like that. I have noticed that people who do research and act on it by going to a health food store or a chiropractor or something like that or herbalist or whatever, tend to be healthier and spend less on health care and take less risk with their health than people who just say, well, they paid for it for me and it's the government, so I'm just going to go and do it. You really have to take responsibility in the sense that you almost have to know as much information about your medical condition as your provider. And that's what people are doing. I mean, go to the health food store sometime and, you know, ask people what's going, you know, their politics, and, and you'll find that they'll be from anywhere from evangelical Christian to anarchist or anything in between. So that's another good thing, you know, to look at. I'm not going to be my own doctor. One full no, at a time, I, one full at a time, one, one full at a time. No. But I'll tell you one thing that happens. <laughs> one in, full at a time. One thing that does happen is that I, I have a, let's say I have a medical condition. I go, to, I go to a health food store and I say, I have this problem. And they say, all right, we have a health encyclopedia here. Look up your condition in the health encyclopedia because by law, I cannot tell you what to take. Not like a doctor could or a nurse could even. And you go there and you look it up and you see what vitamins what type of diet, et cetera, that you go to. And then you go go from there. And I have, I've done that a couple of times and always, you know, turned out to be pretty well. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, throw away their technology. No, the technology is good, for, especially for diagnosis. And if you have a broken leg or something, okay, then you know pretty much what you need to do. But the problem is, is that a lot of our health care is controlled by big pharmaceutical companies and the, um, the doctors' associations. And a lot of, and I, I've been to, I've, uh, I've been to, I was recently in a, a health care situation. I was recovering from uh, an amputation and I have diabetes, and they were giving me a, a diet which was, was all wrong for my diabetes. And I know I cheat occasionally and, and all that, but it's a matter that if you if you discover the answer for yourself, you're more inclined to follow the solutions, the ones that you discover for yourself, more than somebody who just gives you a prescription bag. So this is something else too. Um, so if, uh, those are just some of the things that I have learned over the years. 
in terms of just what's going on. And what you're looking for is like, I look, for example, a lot of left sources are very good in terms of exposing uh, what's wrong, a critique and all that. But then, you know, you, what you're looking for is not just the critique, but what are solutions that have worked. So, you know, answers that are economical, that are safe, that have been used time and time again. And usually the answers involving decentralization of power and figuring out things out for yourself are the ones that work. And it used to be that in a lot of, like hundreds of years ago, you would go, let's say, to a nurse, a midwife, a herbalist, and they would give you something that would work better than things that you have now coming from a hospital. And, I, and the thing is, is that, so you're having an agreement of people who, in a sense, are feminists, as well as people who are, in a, in a sense, very conservative, and they're both coming up with the same thing because they understand the practicality of doing this type of research. So there's all of that. Um, and I find that as more and more of, uh, of that the government trying to make things complicated for us, you know, the, the, not the books, but the bookshelves of regulations, et cetera, and the expense that they entail and all that has been making things so bad that people just throw up their hands and say, I don't know what to do. And we want, to, we want these people to show them, show them how to do the research on these things and let them break off from the system and find out their own type of solutions. So, um, let's see. God, there's just so many things that I'm doing this. Oh, one uh, interesting piece of information that I've discovered, that we all know who Charles Koch is. We all know um, George Soros, who is kind of like the left-wing equivalent of, of Charles Koch. These two people are not only pro-legalization of all drugs, they found a new comp commonality, and they formed an organization called the Quincy Institute, which is basically to rein in Americans' military industrial complex and to pursue the ways of peace rather than empowering the Pentagon. I want to see more of that. It's, it's really that so, so horrible to see so many politicians coming out for wars like against Iran or North Korea or something like that. Well, you know that there's money behind all this. Really bad money of people who basically want to act. Well, when you have a war, you have a closing down of political discussion, you have bureaucracy, um, more taxes, and basically a growing suspiciousness of the people so people just don't want to talk about things anymore. And we shouldn't didn't have that. Um, anybody who thinks that, you know, the time was, you know, that we had during war, like First World War and Second World War, where everybody was gung ho and stuff like that, don't understand that this type of thing went to a lot of different corruption. My mother was one of the most honest and helpful women, she was involved in the black market, buying and selling sugar coupons and things like that. I mean, this is what war and excessive regulations that come from war end up doing, in the sense that they make people who are usually nice, honest people into, you know, people grubbing on the black market for things. Do we want that? No, I guess not. Um, just about every, anything that we see the government is doing has been done better by private enterprise or at least a decentralization of government offices. Um, I mean, you live in Chicago. 
you meet somebody from downtown, from downstate or something like that. And, you know, you're, if you're going to talk about that, you know, bad government, dishonest and wasteful government, you're going to be talking about Chicago or at least Springfield. You're not going to, because somebody is from a small town in Illinois, you're not going to have that. And you'll also see, because of that, there's more problems of poverty and violence in Chicago than you will see in other areas. And it's, it's terrible. I mean, in fact, this, this, uh, the states that have the highest taxation and bureaucracy, like California and New York, are losing population to other states. And the only thing that's, that's saving these, these states is basically that, you know, they've gone to, you know, pot legalization, which is a nice thing, but the reason they're doing it is because they're desperate. And it's unfortunate, but, you know, that's just the way things are going, is that they only move, in a sense, not become efficient because it's a good thing to do, but because they're desperate. Uh, we have that type of problem. So, uh, is there, at, at this point, I think I'd like to see if there's any questions. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let's uh, thank our speaker then. We're going to our Q&A period. Do you need a moderator? Yeah, uh, yeah he probably. Yes. probably. Yes. Yes. Probably. Yes. yes. Please do. Uh, I like being a moderate myself, but if you, if you see yourself. No, this crowd can get rather. Okay, go All ahead. All right. Yes, madam. Okay, okay, man. Um, okay, thank you so much for your speech. Thank you so much for your speech. Thank you. Listen, I have two questions, if I may. Sure. Uh, I came from socialist country. I, ah. I come from the Soviet Union. Oh, ah, okay. So, anyhow, so here I discover a new system capitalism. Uh -huh. And I like it because it's more opportunity, you know, more opportunity. Yeah. Um, so, so my first question: Why, why you do, do, do you like capitalism or no? Or what? If not, why? Why you don't like capitalism? And my the second question: um, How much did you pay in a uh, whole food store for your treatment? Because insurance doesn't cover, right? Well, so I'm over it, 65, so therefore I'm on med Medicaid as well. Oh, yeah, they accept. Right. They accept. And. I was, you know, I didn't really necessarily want to go there, but my doctor said I had to go there, or I could get into some real problems. So, I was in this place, which I'm trying to imagine the nicest prison that you could go to, but still, so it was a prison. So they accepted insurance. You what? Know, they accepted some kind of insurance. And it, it was government that took care of it. I mean, and you know, we have this Obamacare in which the government buys insurance for you, and they arrange for the treatment, and. Wow. You know, it's a lot of the things that they were doing for me, I didn't really want to have done. I don't think they were going to be very useful, but if they were, well, I figured it's free, you know, as free as it could be. I believe that government that governs best governs least. I like markets. When I walk into a store, I see all these things there that, in a sense, I have a choice. And if I don't, I go to a different store, I go to flea markets. Um, I, thrift markets, etc., and farmers markets, and I, I just love the in interaction with people. And of course, when, when you get right down to it, you go on the internet, and you can find any answers that you want. I mean, can we? And, and the thing is, in the Soviet Union, could you have someone like me give a talk? No, no, of course not. We never have. But maybe we'll see, you know, some, some type of change now in China that Hong Kong is becoming free. Yes, sir. Karina, you said that the SDS held its last convention. Was that the Chicago Coliseum? Yeah. All right. I can answer your question as to what happened to it. First, it was not built in the 1930s. It was much older than that. Okay. And two, it's been demolished. Oh, okay. Is so another old? question? No, that's it. Okay. No, no, no. Well, thanks, thanks for that information. Yeah. Go ahead. <coughs> Yes, sir. Important, well, uh, jo uh, Joseph Stalin said, sh show me the man and I'll show you the crime. Now, isn't that what they're doing with Trump? They're, for th three years, they're charging him with treason, with uh, with the monuments, with all this bullshit. Mm -hmm. And it's all false charges, even this impeachment. They come up with these two uh, phony charges 
and they know they can't impeach him. What's going on with these Democrats? I think that everything that Trump has is accused of doing, others, especially Democrats, have been doing the same thing. But he's president. And he's a bully. 63 million of us. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, that's just the way things are, is that they create this morass of rules that anybody could fall in and be swallowed up by them. And it's, it, it is unfortunate. But there's a lot of things that Trump is doing that I don't like as well. You know, all the tariffs and things like that, early on and on, et cetera. And he's giving tons of money to the Pentagon, which is not a good way of handling our finances. That could keep the peace, strong army. Well, there's not a single country in the world that would ever want to attack us. I mean, Russia is, is peaceful with us. China wants to basically do a lot of business with us. He's communicating with them. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the way it is. It's a good person. All right, let's go uh, uh, Pablo, then Charlie. Okay. Hi, I'm Pablo. Uh, uh, would you, you would you characterize the marijuana legalization then in New York State and California as purely because of fiscal and not because of a, a cultural and like political change that the Libertarian Party has helped champion? Well, you know, it's interesting. Marijuana is a cultural issue mm -hmm. as well as a political and a fiscal issue as well. And um, this combination of factors has really moved it up because it, it affects everybody. You better do that, Mike. Okay, who else wanted to? Charlie. Charlie. Yeah, sir, the, um, a lot of people employed in retail and restaurants are, aren't earning enough to live and not having a living wage. And yet the Libertarian Party wants to eliminate minimum wage so that their wages get even lower. And I was wondering, if they're not making any money at all virtually, how are they supposed to enjoy all the markets that you say are so wonderful if they don't have any money? Yeah. What good are markets if you can't buy anything? Well, I'm what, can you look at stuff? Thanks for the you cut question, question Charlie. Stuff, right? appreciate it. I'm a poor person say, myself. Boy, that's nice. I make, le I make less than $10,000 each a year and we have a lot of people church, churches etc that have food banks and uh, places where you can get free clothes places where you can get free furniture things like that and you know so they should go to charity where you get you well, clothes at a, in a food bank that's your solution. It's not, believe me it's not that's the best situation but I think that a lot of the money in our system is being stolen by the bankers and the military industrial complex. The military is taking all the money from yeah. The, yeah. The, the minimum wage employee. Yeah, and their taxes. They just, they just it all guy. up like a sponge and they're not much for anybody else. I like them. All right, any other questions? Joe, you have a question? Stand up. Uh, do you have any more comments about what you said about how the Weather Underground uh, was kind of one of the first groups that started the whole white guilt movement? You should be guilty about. I think it was uh, the whole thing. White guilt was going on long before, but in a sense, they they had institutionalized it in their minds. You know, some of them, in a sense, came from wealthy families, etc. So it, you know, it's sad that way. And they just basic. A lot of them were. I think were. There was a lot of stress being radical at that time, and they were, in a sense, constantly besieged by all these arguments, and they just wanted to get out of it, and so they went underground. And um, some of them have actually said that they were literally driven crazy by them, they just had to get out of it for a while. And eventually they all surfaced, and that movement is now dead. Yeah. Dave. Uh, when I was only about 20 or 21, mm -hmm. uh, there was a uh, the libertarian movement had only just begun. Yeah. And their big thing that they used to garner attention with was putting an end to the income tax. Yep. Virtually nobody paid any attention to it mm -hmm. because everybody knew that that's an impossibility. So as time has gone by, mm -hmm. that turns out only to be one of the spearhead 
things of the Libertarian Party. There are a whole bunch of other things, which I'm not going to bother to mention. You've touched on them. And uh, uh, today the Libertarian Party, the Libertarian Movement, has become, is taken much more seriously. Thank you. And the um, doing away with the income tax has also gained momentum. Yeah, so, the, you look at, for example, the alternative yeah. currencies. I, I just want to finish that. The yeah. thing is, I think these political movements, if they have any, um, uh, uh, if they have any any um, validity, it still takes a lot of time for them to garner uh, uh, attention from the general public. I've heard some people say that more is spent on figuring out taxes than the money that the government collects. And I think it's, you know, we should just get rid of it for that reason alone. Because uh, it's, the whole system is so destructive that way. And in fact, you know, there's other people who say that the income tax collects enough money to pay for the national debt and that's it. So it's, it's not even a source of revenue. Yes, sir. So you're a supporter then of the Liberty Amendment for the Constitution, yeah. right? Yeah. And particularly Section 4, where three years after the ratification of this amendment, the 16th article of amendments to the Constitution of the United States shall stand, be repealed, and therefore Congress shall not levy taxes on personal incomes, estates, and gifts, correct? Right. Okay. All right. right. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Right. Uh, any other, any other questions? Uh, first round questions before we move on to second round questions. All right, George. Well, uh, uh, certain sh Chicago suburbs have approved of uh, reparations for blacks. Now, isn't that with the whole affirmative action we had for 40 years, and they, asked, they stopped that? I asked Murray Rothbard about this. You know, we're talking about reparations for slavery. And the thing is that there's a lot of people um, who, like my, my ancestors, they came to America in the 20s. They weren't involved. Slavery in any other way. Maybe 3% of the American population uh, was involved in slavery. In fact, there were blacks among slaves. In fact, uh, the person who owned the most slaves in Mississippi in 1860 was black himself. And about a third of the, of the overseers in America in around 1860 uh, were black. And then you have people, let's say, who on one side of their family they slaves, and on the side of the family they had over, you know, uh, they were slaveholders. And you take a look at Obama. You know, he's, he's mixed race himself, but his father had nothing to do with be either being a slave uh, or being a slaveholder. Anybody else? Any other questions? Second round questions? Well, I guess we can move on to rebuttals. Oh, or is Charlie, okay, Charlie, you got a second question? Yeah, and progress is, there's a lot of people out there, young people calling themselves progressives. They like progress. Progress is, is either doing something or doing something new. Yeah, if I look over the Libertarian Party, I see they're only, if they're asking about any situation, or problem, their solution is to either one, do less, or two, do nothing. Are you, are, why is the Libertarian Party opposed to progress? <laughs> the term progressive is one of those nothing words. It can mean anything that you want. What? In fact, during the 1920s, progress uh, the progressive, the, the, uh, one fool at a time, let him answer the question. Yeah, Woodrow Wilson called himself a progressive, and he was the worst president we ever had in terms of civil liberties, war, centralizing the economy, all of that. And racism. What does he have to do with the libertarians being opposed to progress? The party wasn't established. What is progress? There's no I definition. It. I defined it. How, what, what, was pro, what was the definition again? Either you, you do something, you give it a, a problem. And you do something, you do something new. Even if it's horrible and it doesn't work, or maybe just waste a lot of money. results and then you do something, uh, 
Again, but you do you you do nothing. Charlie, we've seen lots and of sometimes progress. Doing nothing, nothing is the right thing doing to do. Doing nothing is the solution. And what's your question? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I got. Did you want to continue? Go ahead. You can hand that. All right. Uh, so a lot of uh, socialist-leaning folks, communists, like to call themselves progressive. Um, it, are they really progressive, or are they just reactionary because they're hearkening back to something that's already been tried? And, you know, it's not really progressive to go back on ideas that uh, haven't worked. Am I right? They haven't broken into base. Yeah. And besides, what people call progressive always means expanding the role of the government. You know, I like to see something progressive, which is, you know, getting rid of them. Well, how is another one? No agent? What's that, Charlie? How is progress brought about without an agent? He wants no government. It's allowing the natural healing process of the economy to take by spirits. No, just allowing, allowing head, the free Charlie. market to develop its own solutions. That's doing nothing. All yes. right. Uh, yeah, okay, sir. Because uh, we're not going to get through. Um, sir, uh, <laughs> sitting at Charlie's table. Did you have a question, sir? Your, your no, no, I don't have. Do less and do nothing. What, uh, what, uh, what, uh, all right, George. You got another question? Well, uh, lately, in Chicago and London, there's been a lot of uh, knifings, and I know radical groups like ISIS. They encourage. I've heard them in, in, in Israel, they tell, get a screwdriver, get a knife, and just stab someone in the back. And that's what they're, I think ISIS or these radical groups are encouraging this, because you see a lot, Chicago, there were just two the other day. Legalized gun ownership. <laughs> Bill Murray, it's the anniversary. It's the anniversary. Legal ownership of guns, see less crime. Compare the crime statistics from Houston, Texas, and Chicago. It's the, well, anniversary, the anniversary of Stony Brook, you know, where the 50 children died. It's the anniversary. What's Stony well, Brook? Okay, the, you're, you're talking about mass shootings. Let me address that. They've done a study of a lot of, a lot of the people that are involved in mass shootings, and they found that many of them were on psychiatric medications. This goes back to. Um, <clears throat> That one in Colorado, uh, Columbine. Columbine, right? And especially when a person is on Medicaid, you know these psychiatric yeah. medications, and they take them off of them, and then the person starts drinking, then you got a real, real problem on, on your hands. But uh, you know, they've they've been cases where a person, you know, starts shooting, and other people in in the audience have a gun. And they usually dispatch the guy before he's gotten two shots on. Children in school don't have guns. Uh, you abolish public there. schools? Yes, sir. We haven't heard from you. Uh, 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 in uh, one foot at a time. All yes, right, you, yes, sir. sir. So, oh, shit. Could we get rid of stoplights and stop signs for the traffic in our Yeah. And we what? Can you repeat that again, sir? He wants to get rid of stoplights. No, he's right. asking if libertarians want to get rid of stoplights and stop signs. Yeah. <laughs> do nothing, do less. Yes, right. Anybody <laughs> else? <laughs> <I'm serious. laughs> Any other? <laughs> Sir, uh, did you have a question earlier? Well, Charlie, you got another question? Yeah, sir. Uh, I come from like, one of the captive nations of Eastern Europe. Ah. And uh, Russians are in a aggressive posture right now. And um, you want to. Uh, Get rid of NATO, which is a deterrent to the occupation once again of the, of the captive nation, such as Lithuania. I don't know why. Why do you? Why do you want to see Lithuania become a captive nation by getting rid of NATO? <laughs> <laughs> why do you want that? All right, we, we got don't your you question. Like Lithuania? Right. I can't believe this. What I did mean, we do to you? This is ancient history. The Eastern Bloc thirty years ago. <laughs> thirty years ago? Yes. Yeah. They were a captive nation for fifty years until nineteen eighty nine. Yes, yeah, right. So. And, okay, and they're not captive anymore. But they look Russia is not aggressive anymore. They're not? <laughs> Putin is not aggressive. Hey Charlie, why don't you go to Lithuania and sign up and protect 
feuding this with Matt aggressively. <laughs> <laughs> He's a benign, wonderful guy. Well, if we, I thought we were the right wingers, and we're saying peace. I don't know. This tanky has got the most uh, aggressive foreign policy I've ever heard. Of. Tanky's for NATO is a new one. Go way. ahead. All right, Dave, you got a quick Mr. question. Mr. Travis, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm perturbed that. Hello. Then we were from the aggressive nation. One, one fool at a time. time. I'm gonna get my Jesus Christ. All right, all right. Let's let Travis have his question. All right, Dave, go ahead. Yeah, I'm perturbed that uh, every single week, week after week, it's supposed to be one fool at a time, and Charlie interjects any time he wants, at will, two or three times during a talk, and then he gets his turn and talks. So he gets three or four or five turns to everyone else's one. Yeah. I think this should be stopped. I call I for so Charlie too. to be censored. <laughs> well, uh, I, uh, Dave, I, I let him ask uh, several questions because we have a smaller crowd tonight and, uh, you know, we're still good on time. But this goes every single time. Do I have to be stopped? Is there a second? Is there a second? All in favor of, of censuring Charlie, can you please raise your hands? No. No. I would. Now that you're up there, I'd like to ask you a specific question. What he doesn't know is. Okay, what is that? By the way, we don't govern the galaxy complexes from the podium, which you just did. We don't okay. do that. That's a long-standing rule, way before Charlie. I thought that there was only two rules. Yeah, and I don't you are trying rule. to govern from the podium. <laughs> are you out of to order? Me or to the and we got to hear that. I think stuff. Charlie's trying to stage a coup here. No, we don't allow that ever. We never allow. That. I don't recall that being a rule. He's that the college is not no. run from he's the podium. He's half, half, half one. Uh, to me, cuckoo. He's a staging a coup. Democratic coup. <laughs> I just uh, said, you a question you said? Well, you know, seeing as how you guys are libertarians, mm -hmm. there was a town in Texas. They, they, they would call themselves the freest little city in Texas. They were trying to bring, you know, keep taxes down, keep property things down. But it turned out that later on, most of their major revenue was from traffic tickets and a speed trap. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? What would you say about it? I'm not familiar with that specific small town, but uh, the, I, like from the South Saint, from the from the St. Louis suburbs, there's several towns that are like that. To me, I feel they're very oppressive. Like you're paranoid to drive through them. Uh, you know, uh, they can probably manufacture a reason to search your car once they got you pulled over. Don, did you want to comment on that? Yeah. Yeah. If he doesn't want to comment, you you seem like you got something you want to say. Okay. Oh, well, do we want to go to rebuttals or do we want to do more questions? I think um, Don is third. You uh. Let's uh. Let's, let's, one more let's, question. One more question. One more question. All right. One more question. Uh, uh, who who does the speaker think of the uh, presidential candidate? Who is he for and why? Don, you for a particular presidential candidate? So I really far? don't have one. From the Democrats are like Tulsi Gabbard. Um, on the Republicans, I might go for well, but um, I'm going to wait until the LP decides on what candidate they're going to have. It's not so much the person I'm looking at is the are they putting forth libertarian principles of peace, decentralization, free markets, allowing people to govern themselves. That's what I'm looking for. And if we're not going to do it, other countries will and take away our business. All right. Do we want to get? Do we want to do? Uh, let's go to rebuttals. Let's, all right. We'll do a rebuttal. So everybody who wants to do a rebuttal, well, thanks for speaker. Speaker. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Don. Very good talk. We'll be generous and go five Thank minutes each. Know, five minutes. All right. Let Somebody's going to have to keep in. time. Somebody can keep time, please. Please. Okay. Good speech. We need, uh, we need a five-minute clock. <clears throat> Got your clock. Not a lot. Tim, got your clock. Oh, I'm going to set up and set something else. Let me know when you're ready for me. <laughs> Just go ahead and get started. Don't worry. All right, go one full at a time, please. I'd like to say this on behalf of our speaker. Uh, quite a few years ago, 
I had stomach ulcers. Uh, when everybody quiets down and is ready for me, I'll start. Uh, quite a few years ago, I had a bad case of stomach ulcers. They were bleeding ulcers. And I was in the hospital at one point for, I think, seven or eight days. And when I got out, they put me on Zantac. <coughs> which I later learned did nothing to cure ulcers. It merely, uh, it merely killed the symptoms. So that if I had pain in my stomach, I'd take a Zantac and the pain would go away for a while. The wind up was that uh, later on the uh, bleeding resumed and I still had pain in my stomach, and uh, here I had a big hospital bill on top of it. One bill at a time. <coughs> so the windup was uh, I went into a health food store where I used to go on Milwaukee Avenue from time to time and have a conversation with the owner. And he was very happy to see me, and he asked me how I was, and I was very serious. His name was Nate. I said, Nate, I'm going to die. I said, and unless you can help me, I won't be around too much longer. He said, what's wrong? And I told him that I had ulcers. He got out a big book that was kind of like what uh, our speaker mentioned, uh, like an encyclopedia of the uh, health food industry and he pulled out a section for ulcers, and it, it said some of the same things the doctor told me, which were not to eat greasy food, not to use caffeine, not to take alcoholic beverages, and so on and so on. Well, I said, it, then it mentioned certain things to take. It said to take dark berries, that they tend to act as a, healer for the stomach, and that if I drank a lot of water, it would hold back the bleeding, and so on. And when, he told, when I learned all these things, I said, well, where am I going to get this, medic, this kind of thing? He said, it's right here, and he had a little bottle of pills from Solar Ray Corporation called uh, uh, SP Blend, I think it was called. And I said to him, how much? If he would have said $800, I'd have given him $800 right there on the spot. He said $8. I bought the pills from him. I said, how often should I take them? He said, take two in the morning in the first half of the day and take two in the second half of the day. And uh, by the time you run out of them, you should, your ulcer should be cured. So I did just that. and. Sure enough, my ulcer was cured, and I did a test. Since I didn't have any indication of an ulcer anymore, no more black stool. When, when is it, when Please let me talk, then you can ask me. No more black stool, no more pain in my stomach. I thought to myself, I, I need to do a test. So I drank about a half a glass of scotch straight, and it got me a little tipsy, but it never upset my ulcer and got that going again. So I waited a few more days and I ate a, a whole small pizza, which under other circumstances would have sure done it. It gave me a tummy ache, but it never reactivated my ulcer. And I haven't had ulcers since. Now, what the doctor did was he gave me he pres his prescriptions were for things that would kill the pain, but did nothing to, to uh, cure my ulcer. What this guy Nathan did at the health food store, which later moved to Highland Park, uh, they gave me the right stuff. It cured my ulcer, and I'm here, and I'm healthy from that. No more ulcers, no more black stools, no more stomach pain from the ulcers. Cured, done, and it's history. So 
attempting to self-medicate can be a real good way to go, but you should do so in an educated way. You should talk to people who know the ropes, know the avenues, and that's that. Uh, I want to thank everyone very much for hearing what I have to say. So David, it was happened recently? I'm sorry? Like a year ago? Speak up. Huh? When it's happened? Um, now, probably about 15 or 16 years ago. <coughs> Okay. All right, let's, I usually would wait till later, but I wanted to respond to this rebuttal that I just heard. Let's thank our speaker here, Don, thanks oh, okay. for an interesting presentation here. I won't be beat up. I just want to talk about this health issue here. Uh, there's a website, I don't know if it's still maintained, it's called Quack Watch. Uh, and as a reference librarian, I came across a reference book, um, herbal and, and remedies. And it said there are 80 or 88,000 uh, medicines, herbs for various ailments. Amazingly enough, another reference book that we use on a daily basis, the physician's desk preference, you know, um, in terms of the pharmaceuticals industry, there are basically only 50 or 55 uh, registered drugs, and the rest of them are derivatives of this. So I often have to wonder, what, why how did they list 88,000 when there's basically only 50 real drugs that are being prescribed in pharmacies? Uh, does that, does that, does it, and, and the some other things, uh, if you have an illness and if you basically do nothing, it's been discovered most of the time it, 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 you get cured. So we just heard a story here where a guy had an illness, he could have done nothing, he sort of did some things in the meantime, and then he got cured. And so he said immediately, whatever he did in the interim would have cured his drug. Like he could have tapped the top of his head every morning three times, and that cures ulcers, I guess, because at the end of the period, his ulcer was cured. And seriously, they did some tests. They took an individual, and he went into one of these uh, GNC health food centers, and he described the same thing to each of the clerks in attendance, and we heard something here. Oh, talk to people. Talk to somebody who's knowledgeable. They talked to the people in the in the store, the retail store, and they asked advice regarding illness. That they, and they described the terminal conditions of cancer. Eleven of the twelve sold them all kinds of little herbs and spices and other things. None of which really, let's face it. There were a cure for cancer. Only one of the 12 didn't sell the person something and recommended that he see a physician, a professional medical practitioner for advice regarding his condition. So that's what I mean. And you have such great faith in the market. The market will sell you anything. They will sell you stuff and you, you're sick. And they don't care if you get, they don't really care I don't think if you get a new cure or not, as long as they get to sell you something. This is the market that, oh, we don't need traditional medicine, or we distrust the authorities of physicians. And I'm fully aware, I'm no champion of the pharmaceutical industry, or the hospital association, or doctors, but I have to respect them as professional practitioners of a, of a very inexact science. Uh, and I think there is some dedication on their behalf, and they're applying uh, their skills in, in in the best that they can in situations. Uh, but to, to say that I'm going to go to the marketplace and start doing my pre practicing medicine without a license, uh, I would not recommend that. As a matter of fact, I never really liked it when people came into the public library as a reference librarian 
and they were trying to do their own their own uh, play doctor. I never felt comfortable on that. They're not qualified for that. They would ask me to interpret the literature, the information, and I said, I'm just not qualified to do any of this. And I highly recommend that you make an appointment with a physician who will explain the situation to you. It's not my position to do so. Unlike the clerk in the store, who said he knew everything about it, he could take care of it like that. All right, regarding the libertarian movement, uh, yeah, you guys are pretty cool. You've been around for a while. Congratulations on 50 years of perseverance. Uh, the only thing I wanted to say, it's easy to give advice. You've got to uh, abandon, and I pointed out in some of the interruptions, which I apologize for, but you've got to uh, get rid of these extreme positions and candid stock answers that less government, blah, 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 which is over and over again, and become a real political, you want to be a real political party, there's problems facing this country, you don't come up with preconceived solutions. You look at the problem, like the Democrats did the other day, there's a problem regarding the price and availability of drugs. They sat down and they tried to come up with a solution. I didn't remember the details, but but he threw them all their process. The libertarians would already have the answer without even assessing the problem. Now in any campaign or election, the one thing we look at on the national level is what problems are people concerned about looking for solutions. And you have to take these each at a time. And you can't have preconceived answers or solutions to ever be a mainline party. You have to take the situation and you know, assess it and then come arrive at a decision as to what's the best course of action, the least costly, the least expensive, the greatest good for the greatest number. But if you're going to lock in all the time, the same answer to no matter what it is, is blah, 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 the free market or all the, the stock answers, why don't you make a list of those? But one size does not fit all. And if you want to mature, take the next 50 years and do it like here. I was singularly amazed looking over the libertarian platform. I refuse to recognize so many problems confronting our society. Our society is not perfect. This is not a perfect country. But to disregard it and say, well, they don't exist or whatever, blah, 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 or the stock answers that you pull out one at a time, uh, repetitive parrot-like uh, things. No, even when it, it doesn't fit the situation here. That's what I mean. I, I want mature people. Can I who, respond you know, now? No, 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 no. no? Yeah, you got to very <laughs> Anyhow, I'll, yeah, I'll give them a jab. All right, take care. All right, thank you very much. Right, next. Right. Hang on, I'm upset here. Right, don't get upset. <laughs> <laughs> Government doesn't cure people. Medicine cures people. Doctors cure people. Libertarians are not here to dispute uh, cancer cures, criticize cancer cures, second guess doctors. I agree with the speaker that every patient should have a little bit of medical knowledge, enough to know enough about their own basic health. Um, I, I've been to a doctor, I felt like, you know, these people get paid the more vaccines they give. Vaccines don't cure diseases, they prevent diseases. If you already have a disease, you should not get a vaccine because it can actually make you sick if you already have the disease. So that's why you shouldn't get a vaccine unless you've been tested for the disease first. The FDA, our government's FDA, which our taxes pay for, they have legalized things like aspartame, sucralose, and 800 other toxic chemicals uh, which are in our bodies and in the air and other consumer products. Babies today are born with 200 toxic chemical products in, in, their, in their bodies. Um, you remember when the Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party were all arguing about whether, oh, is it the government colluding with corporations too much, or is it corporations colluding with government too much? As I think I figured out a pattern here. It's both of them. Uh, you could argue all back and forth all day about which party or whether it's government or business that's making all these toxic chemicals illegal that are in all your uh, artificial sugars on your tables, by the way, today. And also there's probably glass in your salt. 
Um, so yeah, there's plenty of, of ways that government has failed us, and we have to recognize that it's a government, even if it's been, you know, they say it's, oh, it's government, but our government was bought out by corporate interest. Yeah, 70 years before I was born, I was born into this. Like, I, none of us in this room alive have ever seen what it's like to have a free public government like we had before 1913. We don't know that we could ever have a good government, and that is why there is an IWW, that's why there are libertarians and anarchists who say that progressivism is not, it, it's, it's too naive, it's too trusting of government. Um, that's why we need to consider that maybe we need to work outside government avenues, and that is why I appreciate uh, the speaker's comments tonight. I think he's, you know, he's made conscious efforts to reach out to the left, at least the elements of the left that the libertarians can get along with. And I went to college in uh, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, so I learned about the weather underground and the hippie movement, the you know, the bombing of the engineering building or something. Um, so yeah, yeah, physics building. Thank you. So yeah, I mean, I've always been uh, in favor of you know, doing what Carl Hess did. He was a Goldwater speechwriter, and then he hung out with Murray Rothbard. He was trying to bring together the anti-war new left and the anti-war old right of the Goldwater and Taft variety that Ron, you know, Ron Rand Paul became a, a you know, um, remnant of. So another thing, Netherlands deregulated traffic. They tried to remove some signs. You know, I, I, you guys are probably used to it in Waukegan, but up in, or sorry, in Chicago. But I live in Waukegan, an hour north of here, where they just started putting these, you know, light up advertisements. It's like cops pull us over all the time for distracted driving. Meanwhile, they got these distracting dashboards in their own cop cars, and they got lit up signs everywhere that, you know, you look at a hot lady or a bottle of booze, and then you run over a pedestrian. So government is just as guilty um, as, as private companies of just trying to lure us into. I don't know, just lure us into a life of crime and, and needing ah. needing to compete against each other harder and, you know, sell each other out, our friends and family, step over them for a job and for resources. And none of this has anything to do with the, what, the, what the people want. And if you think it's so crazy that private interest could regulate itself or private enterprise could regulate itself, um, think about cooperative enterprises regulating themselves. That's called communism. So if we just had a little private enterprise regulating themselves, and you know, they actually gave their workers some rights in the company, we would have a situation pretty close to communism. It would be very hard to distinguish whether it would be capitalism or communism. And that's why we need the left and the right talking to each other about how can we get along without having war, without having disagreements, without having big government. So I really appreciate uh, hearing everything the speaker said tonight, and I agree with the vast majority of it. Thank you. All right. All right, next. Zucker. David Zucker. With regard to the Labor Party's big losses in England, I don't see that many parallels between the United States and Great Britain. The simple reason that it was as much a vote against Jeremy Corbyn as it was that against, against anything else, who was a terrible person, who was a dreadful anti-Semite, and most people in Great Britain, from what I understand, decided that he didn't want, that they didn't want him running the government, period, end of story. And that that's why Boris Johnson, who isn't much better, got in. Um, with regard to President Trump's current troubles in Congress, he brought it on himself. He's an idiot, he's a fool, he thinks he can be king. Well, Congress is telling him that the answer to that is no. It's that simple. With regard to President Wilson, no, he was not a terrible president. Granted, he was for a lot of things that libertarians are not for. He was for, for example, a stronger central banking system and help push the establishment of the Federal Reserve, which I'm for. He was for increased competition in big business, and that's why he pushed for the Clayton Antitrust Act, which I, as a liberal and a Democrat, am proudly for. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> hey, you got a problem? One Too time bad. Time. One fool at a time. Um, with regard to the comment about doctoring yourself and so on, and the market wanting to sell you stuff, well, yeah, they do. Think about all those commercials that ran when I was a boy for like Annis and Buffering that always began with the words, nine out of ten doctors recommend. Well, nine out of ten doctors also smoked as well. Um, thank you. Yeah. Okay, next. Next. Who's next? We got an open mic. 
I'm going to just talk to the gentleman later about why Woodrow Wilson is the worst president. Right? All right. Why don't you, you tell all of us? I, 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 there are no cameras. There. You want medicine, Joe? Too many I can, but why don't you go ahead and go up first? No, I, 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 I'd like to say something. Go ahead, Dave. We got to get their speakers up there next, so keep let's keep moving. Okay. Go ahead, Dave. Sorry about that. There. Oh, the rules. Which rule? Yeah. Yeah. I only thought it was no full at a time and no personal attack. Where do you get two, two, two shots of They time. just asked if anybody else wanted to talk, Charlie. You know the rules. And I volunteered. I'm within the rules. No. Now, if I may, I'll speak. If, I, if I'm against the rules, I'll walk away. Okay. So. I'll walk away. One full at a time, Charlie. And. Yeah, walk away. Charlie. One, one okay, time, that's Charlie. a majority of one. Uh, in the meantime, uh, okay, Charlie, I'll stop and wait while you talk, okay? Let me know when you're done, and then I'll walk away. Huh? That was a majority of one. That's all. Everybody else wants me to talk. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so either shut up or get up here and talk. All right. Over here. Sit out. Sure. Go ahead, Dave. Go, Dave. Sit out. What's your position on anti-bullying, Charlie? <laughs> Okay. He goes the rules. What the hell is going on? Does anyone have a turn? Oh, All right. Now, do I get to talk or don't I? Yes, yes, you do. Yeah, you do. Thank you. When the pilgrims first came to this country, they had doctors. They had remedies for people's ailments. Some of them weren't so good, and some of them were pretty good. One of the... Uh, things they had was bleeding people, which we know today isn't such a good idea. But the um, fact is, the Indians had all kinds of herbs, which through trial and error they knew to work. And many pilgrims, when someone was real sick, they went to the Indians to get with and presented their problem and got their Indian medicine man to give them the herbal remedy. So many of our people survived due to the medicines that the Indians had to give to the white man. And so uh, herbal remedies are uh, very, very applicable. They work and they work today. So we shouldn't sell that sort of thing short. Uh, so, uh, and I think that uh, when they say they just want to make money, everybody wants to make money. So that's not something we can throw in the face of everyone that, well, doctors just want to make money, or uh, pharmaceutical companies just want to make money. They all want to make money. The point is, will your remedy work or won't it? And we have many herbal remedies. Uh, I think some of the things we use around the house today, like chamomile tea, probably were first given to us by the Indians. Uh, there are many, many of them. And so that's really all I wanted to say. Good day, yes. Okay. All right, let's get up there and uh, keep, keep our uh, microphone clear with opinions tonight. Um, I want to thank Don for coming up and uh, for giving a very interesting talk. Yes. Uh, I first met Don uh, the night that I became I I chair of Libertarian Party of Chicago. He happened to be at that meeting. Uh, so that was pretty interesting. Uh, and it was through that I was able to be introduced to Don and all the crazy stuff he's done in his life. Um, regarding progressivism, uh, so progress is a very subjective uh, term, uh, you know, one man's progress is another man's reaction, I suppose. Uh, but I think if uh, if we're going to if we're going to if we're going to do the left right based on progress reaction on a progress reaction sort of scale, I would have to say that uh, advocating for socialism and advocating for capitalism, or excuse me, socialism and communism, uh, is basically hearkening back to something. Uh, it's already been tried. It's wanting to go back to the old ways of doing things. That sounds pretty, what maybe Charlie might call progressive, is actually reactionary. 
Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, communism was tried, it fell. It's been pretty much uh, dead for 30 years. Then we got people like Bernie Sanders and the rise of the democratic socialists that are kind of making these ideas more in vogue. But, uh, American you know, um, I'm glad the Libertarian Party and Libertarian movement in general is swelling in popularity and, you know, it's bubbling up, it's percolating, it's, it's going to reach a critical mass. And, uh, you know, it's going to be to the point where um, I think it will be a very significant uh, force in American politics. If not, the Libertarian Party will definitely influence the two major parties or maybe replace one of them. Um, I did so um, I think it's also interesting uh, how, uh, and I feel bad for people like David Zucker who have to maybe put up with some of these people, but uh, it's, it's interesting how the Democratic Party, especially here in Chicago, is just openly comprised of tankies and Stalinists and, and uh, all sorts of authoritarian left-wingers. Um, I, I guess you, I guess you can't really do anything about it. Um, but it is, you know, it, the, the Communist Party of the United States uh, doesn't even run people anymore. They just endorse the Democrat. So um, I feel bad for the Democrats who have to put up with those kind of elements within their own party. Uh, it's really going to bite them in the ass, I think, uh, in this year or next year. All this kind of super far left agitation is going to do nothing more except alienate everyday folks and make them want to vote for Trump. So probably need to cool it, guys. Uh, I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right. Okay, next. We got uh, still got an open mic. Next, please. Anyone else want to go? Is it my turn now? Yes. Oh, well, actually, I'm going to. You want to go, Tim? Yeah. <laughs> yes, Charlie. Quack Watch still exists. I just looked it up online. And I was also looking at the definition of quackery. It's a uh, belief or claim that is falsely misrepresented. And Charlie, right here and now, your progressive ideas and communistic leanings are nothing but pure quackery. <laughs> it has been proven over time that when you lean towards capitalism, good things happen. We may, you know, our poor people are living better than kings did 200 years ago. Why? Because of the widespread introduction of capitalistic systems and processes throughout the rest of the world. Yeah. Globalization has done more to reduce abject poverty in the world than any other system combined. We are living much better lives because of globalization, because of the free market, than any other system around. If you take a look at some of the measures, we're living longer, we have less childhood diseases, we have a lot longer lifespans, we have better medical care, and it's just a better life as far as, it could, as, as the American, average America does than the rest of the world does, and the rest of the world is starting to catch up. However, capitalism does produce over time inequality. And the reason it does is because of special favors given to corporations that governments use. And that it becomes a crony system, which is what a lot of people are not liking these days. There is nothing wrong with getting rich. There is nothing wrong with producing a product that people want. There is nothing wrong with trying to keep your family wealth either. What is wrong is when there's special favors given out to it 
to the government. And the thing is, I'm not against tax. I'm not against things like taxes or government because even Adam Smith said we have to provide some funding for the general commons. And it is in his book, The Wealth of Nations, if you had bothered to read it. He talks about, you know, the public commons like school and police protection and things along those lines, which I tend to agree with. And today, we live in a much more complex world than our country did in 1914. As a matter of fact, our government does do a lot of things well. You know, there is such that there is a need for regulations for products and, and services and, and things like that, such as any fraud measures and other things. Uh, health departments and restaurants, for example, that help keep them clean and disease free. Uh, local governments with the enforcement of traffic laws reasonably and, and, and other things. And of course, you know, we have our court system and it still does require money to operate. The question is, is in government corruption and over-regulation? And sometimes, I think right now, our tendency is to over-regulate a little bit in some fields and under-regulate in others. My point of the matter is this. We've seen what works and what doesn't. We know how to make the world a better place. Right now, as of the last five years, there hasn't been too much hope for some of the liberal democracies with some of the rise of these authoritarian leaders. But they will come down, probably much quicker than we think. Because one piece of this is that we have today that they didn't have was an open web, was an open internet and web. Many countries still try to regulate it, but there are ways around it uh, through location-based things, the Tor browser and other things. But most people today have more access to more information than they ever have. And because of that, our world is a much better place. One of the reasons for, for a lot of the unrest we're having now is that when people look at the web, they say it's like huh. Oliver Twist is coming to town and he's upset. They see the gross inequities that sometimes exist between the ruling class and the, sometimes they call the cronies and privileged class in countries and how it's rigged against them. Well, in a truly capitalistic society, one of the things that uh, does happen is that there's equal opportunity for all. The biggest reason why countries in the developed world don't have full capitalism is that all citizens can't participate in it because of onerous requirements for business ownership and licensure of governments and everything else. You don't have the access. For example, if you go to Egypt to buy a piece of property legally and outright, it would take you almost 17 years hmm. working full time, night and day, to get your title free and clear. In the United States, that process, it may be cumbersome, but it's called a closing and it usually takes a couple of hours. You can buy a car at a dealership, and it just takes a 20, 30 minutes to get the title transferred, and the state says, okay, here's my piece of paper, it's my car. And one thing that you gotta also understand about capitalism and its forms is that there's always a bit of property rights involved with some kind of a euro or licensure system. This credit card, I, can, I know I'm me, but this credit card also says to the merchant, hey, this is Tim, he's good for it. And funds are transferred, and there's a certain trust that's big, been involved with the banks. But we wouldn't have this system without a form of a database or trust, or something that represents the property that I have. In short, capitalism has been the best way to produce wealth and to better society's lives than ever. I rest my case. Charlie, communism is quackery. <laughs> capitalism is his own book. Capitalism is the best way to improve lives. It is. We're in the middle of the holiday season here. I spoke on this topic a number of years ago. <laughs> there are three types of items that constitute the primary Christmas gifts that people shop for. 
That's clothing, electronics, and clothing. That's well said. Let's look at each in sequence. Clothing industry, what is that benefiting the people in Bangladesh? Where they have these horrendous fires, where they like hiring young girls because they can manipulate them. The most inhuman conditions. Uh, close to slavery altogether. What about the gulags under Stalin? So that you could sell them, you could put them in a box and give it to somebody as a gift. Materialist. This is this is clothing industry. This is one of the examples of the success of yeah, but let's look at electronic industry. Electronic industry is noted for putting together uh, Foxconn installations of 5,000 employees, which have 12-foot uh, high fences around them, because they don't want any any reporters or labor labor officials from the international community to see the working conditions. It's in a in communist these country, Charlie. And they're putting one up in Wisconsin. These are the installations where the young people were committed suicide as a means of escape. So this is what you've done in the electronics industry. Again, we've seen what free market capitalism has done. Now let's look at the toy industry. The toy industry is notorious for one. There's two things that stand to mind regarding the manufacture of toys are, if you work in a toy factory, do you know where you live? You live at the table underneath your work table, you sleep, and that's your residence. Because you get a little bit of sleep, and then you're you're up at the top again to crack it on, making dolls or putting, you know, heads on doll bodies. And the other thing about amazing thing about toy manufacturing is it's, it's entirely made out of plastic for the most part. The only thing is, I and I'm not a chemist. But I do know through the fact that the the prettiest colors um, in, in plastics are the most dangerous and hazardous, and this is what they use in the industry. Uh, there are toys that are produced by the capitalists, and this is for, for your children to play with. They don't really care. They've intercepted in the container shippers, such as in New York. I know that's from the railroad industry, because the, these, these are lethal lethal items for any young, young child to be exposed to. Uh, they're carcinogenic toys, and, and this is what you're producing here. Uh, regarding toys in general, I guess since the libertarians are the party who do nothing, you, if all you can do is shop at the dollar store for Christmas, you know, they say, oh, that's okay, you know, no big deal, you know. Uh, if the 99% of the people, that's the only place they can go to get something of, of a gift for the children to celebrate the holiday. Regarding the Indian stuff, if you want, I always come to mind, if, you, you, you know, let's go, I heard this earlier, something, let's, let's go back to an earlier period of time where things were much better. And I kind of kept on thinking when they used to have medicine, they met a guy in a wagon from each town and sell you Indian Joe's, you know, magic juice that will cure everything before we had government uh, monitoring you know, the medical into the food and drug industry, Pure Food and Drug Act. Let's return to those idyllic days when we didn't have the government interfering in medicine, in medical matters, and you could have uh, Indian Joe's, get some of the Indian Joe's juice, uh, and uh, you'll feel better in no time. You know, thank you very much. Okay. Any other rebutters? Any other rebuttals? <laughs> All right. If there's no more rebutters, our speaker gets the last word. All right. We went over it all. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It was pointed out to me uh, just recently that a hundred million people were killed by communists, but you know, you gotta give these guys a break, they're just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> Then again, I don't let 
live under communism, so, you know, that kind of thing. Um, the mock remarks made before about not natural healing and medicine. Uh, the oldest form of healing that we have is Ayurvedic medicines, which goes back to India's prehistory. That's like uh, 5,000 years old. I mean, think of it. Practice for 5,000 years old. When's the last time you heard of the FDA um, busting somebody from Ayurvedic medicine? You want to have both medicine? One full at a time, Charlie. Yeah, Charlie. Yeah. A speaker it, gets it the last a, you word. Know, it, it doesn't happen. I mean, they're, they're always you know, pulling back one medicine or another FDA on and that's, you know, and that's good. And, you know, they have all types of medical insurance for, for the, these pharmaceutical companies are coming out, you know, with new drugs all the time, millions and tens of millions of dollars in trials and all that kind of stuff. But the reason that we don't have much um, natural medicine in the United States is that the stuff from the pharmaceutical companies well, they have, you know, they get a medicine, they get a monopoly on it, they spend $10 million to make sure that supposedly that it's, that it's okay, and it still isn't okay. Yet natural medicine, because it's been used for, you know, thousands of years and stuff, it's not going to be, nobody's going to make a monopoly of it. That's it. That would be impossible. So it's, um, I would say, you know, let you know, the natural healers who've been doing these things for thousands of years, usually in conjunction, by the way, with various priests and healers and stuff like that. And it's worked pretty well. Um, I'm not saying, and the thing is, you don't have to go exclusively one way or the other. I mean, when I get, you know, I have something wrong with me, I usually check with the doctor first. And then, you know, they say, well, we want you to do this and take these pills. And I say, statins? No, I, I don't want a heart attack. So I basically, I look up, I see what the condition that I have, I get that determined, and then I look up in the literature what natural healing does best. And usually the simplest form of healing is the best. I want to thank you all for your nice applause and your intelligent questions. And the ones that are not intelligent, well, <laughs> We'll just leave that alone and all that. Are they going to kick us out soon? In about, uh, I mean, you can still go on for a few more minutes. Uh, half but an hour. For a few more minutes? Half an hour. I'll take any question or something rather than just rambling. Okay. Any more questions, guys? All right, well, that's fine then. All right. Okay. Uh, it's. I think it's underneath the Vincent's jacket. Oh, okay. What are you looking for? Sir? I guess. Uh, I guess we'll we'll close this meeting of the College of Complexes. All right. Yay. Thank you for speaking to me. Thanks, Don. It's good Thank talk. Yeah. Merry yeah. Christmas. Merry Christmas. See you next week for my right. talk. I didn't agree with what you talk? said, but it was very interesting. I'm going to do a slideshow of oh, good. Oh, That's the highest form of compliments I find. Uh, if you got any good oh, memes, okay. uh, I'm going to try to like take up the entire hour. I always do. 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 I